does God's word say? And this is the initial three questions. And, and I'm going to pause after each one and let any of you that uh, maybe want a clarification, uh, if, it, you know, if there's something I can clarify, I will. But does God's word say, number one, pork eating is okay? You say, well, that's ridiculous. Well, there are whole divisions of Christendom that don't think that. Uh, you know, there, there are all types of people. In fact, I even remember sitting in a seminar with Bill Gothard telling us how, how we needed to really re-examine our diets. And, and, and that was way back in the 70s. That was a long time ago. But, but I went out of that seminar wondering whether I was Jewish or not because, I mean, it was, it was heavy duty, a lot of the, the law. So is pork eating okay and all the other parts of the kosher, uh, ceremonial law. Secondly, is Sabbath keeping optional? The reason I say that is Paul said in Romans, if one person wants to observe a day above another day, they can. They just can't be smoldering that you're not doing it. And see, that's the problem. Nobody seems to be able to observe uh, a personal Sabbath without wanting. Come on. Come on, it's supposed to go back. There we go. Uh, without want, I did it again, I was talking to it. Uh, <laughs> Sabbath keeping is fine for ourselves. If you want to have a rhythm and a, a quiet interlude in your life, it's perfect. If you don't want to buy a single thing on Sunday, uh, actually if it's a Sabbath, you shouldn't buy it on Saturday because Sunday isn't the Sabbath. The, I mean, there is no connection between Sunday and the Sabbath day ever in the Bible, so that isn't even discussable. But if you want on Saturday not to buy anything, not to go anywhere, to be real quiet, not cook, I mean, you can go as far as you want. That's fine. It's just if you smolder because someone else isn't doing it and you think they're sinning and you think they're less spiritual, that is where the Bible speaks. So is Sabbath keeping optional? Yes. Is pork eating okay? Does the Bible say yes? Is homosexuality sin? Again, yes. All three. Uh, and here's just some verses for you. I'm going to go through all of them. Pork eating, uh, Leviticus says it's, it's absolutely not for Jews. That's all it says. Mark, Jesus said that he declared all foods clean. That's interesting. Jesus declared all foods clean. In Acts, Peter didn't get the message. He, he heard that in Mark 7, but Peter didn't get it in Acts 10 by then. And so the Lord had to three times tell him that there's no dietary constraints upon New Covenant believers. And then Colossians, the Apostle Paul, is doing a mop-up operation and, and saying the same thing. On the Sabbath, yes, it's the, the fourth command, in Exodus 20, 8, actually through 10. But in Luke, Jesus says, hey, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. And, and because they were saying, you're not keeping our rules. See, people love to have laws so they can make rules and tell you you're not keeping them. And so the, the religious leaders were saying, Jesus, you're not keeping them. And so Jesus explains he's Lord of the Sabbath. The whole book of Hebrews is all about the supremacy of Christ, fulfilling all of the law and Colossians, Paul, again, does a mop-up operation, says it. Homosexuality, Leviticus says, absolutely an abomination to God. And what's interesting is, the Lord never says pork is an abomination to him. Now, he said people that eat, you know, pork and have pork broth and come into the temple with it, they are an abomination, but not eating pork. It was their disregard for the holiness of God that was abominable to him. But God says it's an abomination. Paul reiterates what Christ or what uh, the Old Testament said in, in Romans 1. In 1 Corinthians 6, again Paul reiterates it. And again in 1 Timothy 1, he reiterates it. And what we see is that the moral absolutes of God, which are not involved in, in the ceremonial or the, the judicial law, but the moral law, the moral character of God is unchangeable. So let's, let's just look at that first. Let's, let's get to the last one then. Was homosexuality always presented in God's word as sin? Yes, always. Leviticus 18.22. Now look at this. This is so different than eating pork. Look at the wording. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an 
abomination. You want to do a good word study, just click in the concordance or online, look up abomination. And God is very strong in what he says. Now, why is this an abomination? Because homosexuality is a direct, as, as well as everything associated with it, as well as gender changing and uh, what's it, transvestism and, and all of the, uh, the, the blurring, the androgyny, all of that is a direct attack on the creator who created man as male and female and very clearly has gender-specific roles, gender-specific activities. It's very clear. God wants a very clear male-female. Doesn't want it blurred, doesn't want the boys to be like girls, doesn't want the girls to be like boys. He wants it very clear. And, and Satan always wants to attack anything that God has, has made very clear. And so right from the beginning, homosexuality is not new. It is old. It just fills the Old Testament. That, that, the whole Baal thing was all about shrine male prostitutes. And, and there's a word for them, uh, kodesh, and, and it's a word that, that speaks of perversion. So God, it, it's not just Sodom and Gomorrah. It's, it's all the way through the fabric. I mean, all the way through the kings, the chronicles, into the major and minor prophets. Homosexuality was always part of the, the wickedness that God wanted to root out of the Canaanites. It was so much a part of their religion, that's why it kept seeping in. But Leviticus 18.22, don't lie with a male as you do with a, uh, a woman. It's an abomination. Deuteronomy 22.5, I just threw this in for you to see another one. This is connected. A woman shall not wear. Now, it's interesting, the Hebrew word for wear isn't re, just uh, confined to clothing. It is to, to make herself like. And, and it, it can be, and it, it can go in a lot of directions. But she is not to be making herself like anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garments. Now, if we just went that far and, and it was Moses saying, because I don't like it, then we'd say, oh, for all who do so are an abomination. Now, this one, this one is big. It doesn't just say an abomination that normally says, an abomination to the Lord your God. You know, it used to always, I mean, I, somewhere to go to camp, I had to read the whole Bible, and I remember that verse from being a little boy. And I remember going to church retreats and having people dress up. Men dress up as women. Everyone would laugh and 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 laugh, and, and they really did look ridiculously funny. But you know, I could never forget that the God who doesn't change says that is an abomination. It doesn't stop there. Watch this. Paul, now, now remember I said, okay, some people say, wait a minute, that was just to the Jews. Okay, you can allow someone to say that, and you can say that it was an abomination of the Lord to the Jews. Does it cross the line and come into the New Testament? And does it become a part of the fabric of the early church that is, that is understood to be distinct from the rules for the Old Testament rules for the children of Israel? Now, it's fascinating. This is the decline and fall of humanity, Paul's writing in Romans 1. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And, and I'm jumping in the story. Remember, it says they didn't want to know the truth and they suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. It's all before there. But he's continuing. For even their women, why did he start there? If you know anything about society in general, in most societies around the world, prior to our current rewriting of everything by our culture that is trying to electronically permeate the world with kind of a revisionist view of everything, but historically, almost every culture in the world, the, even the Greek culture, I mean the Greek culture magnified homosexuality. But even the Greek culture, you know, when they saw lesbianism, it was like, even to the Greek culture, it was kind of like, well, I guess you can do that. So Paul starts out with a cultural acknowledgement that, that even it, it, it's, it's been known that men exchange and become perverted, but when women do it, 
It's against nature. Verse 26 ends right over there. It's against nature. Whose nature? Against God's creative order, against God's creative design. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and on and on it goes. So homosexuality is continuously presented that way. Now look at what Paul says. Now this is what's fascinating, and I'll finish up here real quick and we'll have questions. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived neither fornicators. Now, what's interesting is fornication is always first or second on every list of sins in the epistles. It's always first or second. Why? Because it is so pervasive. It's, it's so much for us to be on the guard and, and, and to resist because God has wired us to be sexual beings. And so Satan wants to, to short the wiring. And so one way he shorts it is to, to be involved sexually outside of marriage fornication, to be involved sexually inside of marriage, adultery, and, and with someone other than your husband or wife. And so fornication is first. Nor idolaters. And there's another form of fornication, adulterers, you know, the, the married unfaithfulness. Now look at this. Nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. It's interesting that Paul uses both words that were in the culture one for the active aggressor and one for the passive non-resistor. And he says both are sin. Not, not just sin, will not go to heaven. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. Now, just let me ask you, have you ever taken something or not fully claimed your tips if you're a waiter or not fully claimed everything on your taxes or, you know, made the numbers a little bit bigger? All of us in one form or another, are thieves. I mean, have you ever taken a paper clip that wasn't yours? I mean, there, there, is, there is reason to say that, that almost everybody has taken something. You know, like the people that go and take a whole handful of napkins, you know, because they don't want to buy them. They just want to take them from the store and make the store pay, you know, like the, the uh, Speedway. I mean, in all, we're, we're so given to think we deserve. So we're all thieves. But does that mean if you've ever taken a napkin that you can't go to heaven? See, all of these are unrepentant, continuous behaviors. It's not, did you ever take something? It's, are you unrepentantly a thief? Are you unrepentantly drunk? Are you unrepentantly living in fornication in your mind or in your body? Are you unrepentantly disagreeing with the way God said sexuality should be oriented. You understand that? That's, that's the, at the deepest level, homosexuality is a rebellion against the Creator. That's, that is, is what Paul is getting at here. They're refusing the design of the Creator. Uh, and, but, but look what it says. He repeats, will not inherit the kingdom of, of God. But look what he says in verse 11, and such were some of you. You know what the blessing of that is? That means there were people openly rejoicing in the fact that God had saved them from the direction of their sin. And they, they said, that was me. I was, I was a thief or covetousness or homosexual or sodomite. You were, you were washed. This is a, apoluomi is, is a beautiful word of being absolutely uh, scrubbed. You were sanctified. That's what we've been talking about. That's allowing the, the sanctifying life of Christ to change me. You were justified. That means I know that the record of my sin, Al Curley, my friend that I baptized, when he, uh, you talk about a blessing. Here I, here I was putting him uh, under the water, and as I brought him up, you've never seen a more angelic radiance because to him, he said at his baptism, he said he just felt physically what he knew spiritually. He said he felt all the years of his 600 illicit homosexual partnerings, he said he just felt it all fall away. Now, you know what he said? He said he was still tempted as long as I knew him. He said he had to avoid gyms, you know, gymnasiums. Uh, he had to avoid certain places because he, for life, would struggle with the temptation. But what changed is 
the justification, he knew that he was completely forgiven and the record was removed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, is homosexuality ever presented in God's word as the way a person was born? No. Now let me repeat that. Is homosexuality, homosexuality ever presented in God's word as the way a person's born? No. Is it presented that way in society? Yes. And, and, and I'll talk about that for just a moment over here. Let's see, can I, can I write on this? Um, um, come on. There, I need this. Let's see if it'll work, if I can write on it. This is, sexual, this is a chart of sexual orientation. I'm putting Christ in the middle because Jesus was perfect. He was a perfect man. And if humanity has sexuality, then Jesus had sexuality, okay? It was perfect. You know what that means? That though he was a man, he was not driven by his desires. His flesh did not dominate. And so Jesus would be the perfection of sexuality. Uh, this would be male, this would be female, this would be aggressive, this would be passive. Uh, so what we have is we have men that are way too sexual. And we have women that are way, I mean, they are, uh, as Solomon said, the eyes of a man are never satisfied. A harem didn't, you know, a thousand women didn't satisfy Solomon. So let's just put Solomon up here, you know. And uh, I mean, he just, he just wanted one more. And then uh, there are others down here that, that just uh, have no desires, it seems, and, and Paul says that they are eunuchs, they just, they're like Paul, they just, for whatever reason, they have no interest. The same is true on the continuum for women. Then, basically, men, uh, this is the realm of their sexual desire, and this is the realm of women's sexual desire. Now, I would say that that is just about the, the vast majority of people. But there are some people, some men, that their desire, wherever they are in the continuum, goes over here. And they, they begin to have desires that, that are for, instead of for women, their desires are like a woman's for a man, and they are beginning to not stay as a man desiring women. And there are women that, that are lesbian also. And that overlap is not homosexuality. That's temptation. And so what I can say is, let me just erase all of my drawing here, make it simpler. I want you to understand that a person can be born uh, well, no, let me put it this way. Every person is born a sinner. So we're all sinners. And some sinners are men who are insatiably, unsatisfiably desirous of women. Others are men that have a desire for other men. And then vice versa. You could have women who have a desire for uh, men, which would be called heterosexuality. And then there are women that have desire for other women and that is lesbianism, but that desire, just like it is sin for a man to lust for a woman, it is equally sinful for a man to lust for a man, and that desire, just because a man has lust, does not make him aberrant. It means that he has not brought that lust under the gracious lordship of Christ if he's a believer. So, I, I want to I answer the, the truth of the Bible is, if don't ask uh, you know, the psychologist, but is a person born a homosexual? No, the Bible says a homosexual is someone that is choosing, choosing, that's what Romans 1 says, choosing to, to live in sin. Is the, what, what we would call an, uh, a person whose orientation, uh, kind of like the, the Earth's uh, magnetic poles, you know, reverse. And some people, gradually, for whatever reason, like Al Curley, because of his dominant father, he began to not like the, the normal way that God wired him. And he began to have temptations for men. Does that make him a homosexual, biblically? No, it makes him a sinner. Homosexuality is when lust conceives, it gives forth. When, when we choose with our will to go that direction. So I just want to clarify, you can have 
either orientation, a man tempted by men or a woman tempted by women, and not be what the Bible defines as a homosexual. So look in the scriptures. I believe that if you read Corinthians clearly, Paul is talking about people that were struggling, and, and he was reminding them that they are washed, they are sanctified, they are regenerated. Number two, is homosexuality worse than the other sin? Does the Bible say that? No, it doesn't. Now, what homosexuals do is horrific, and God destroyed Sodom for what they did, but he also destroyed Nineveh for what they did, and their sin was witchcraft. So you have to say that, that there isn't like there is one worse sin and homosexuality is there and that guy from Florida or wherever he's from that, that, that's always on the news is, you know, and he's crusading almost militantly against homosexuals. That isn't a biblical uh, at all orientation. Is homosexuality, according to God's word, unforgivable? No, it's not. It is like any other sin forgivable is part of the daily struggle and temptation of life in the early church were some of them struggling with, with their, their former desire in a homosexual way? Yes, you bet. It is impossible for those people to have been saved out of homosexual lifestyles to walk through the marketplace and see all the naked gymnasts and not be severely tempted. And that's why they had to choose, like we talked about this morning, to say yes to God, to say no to sin, to say yes to their new master and no to their old master. So, um, how should we treat homosexuality? Homosexuality is a very enslaving sin. If you ever want to uh, read an interesting book, read the, the Coroner of New York City. And, and he was interviewed by an FBI agent, and they're not Christians, either one. They talk about how, and I mentioned it this morning, it's a fascinating study uh, of how aggressive the homosexuals are, especially when they're jealous. But so is bitterness a very enslaving sin. I know, I know Christians that have been enslaved to bitterness for their whole life. So is drunkenness. I mean, I grew up in a family of, of alcoholics. I mean, everybody I know on both sides of my family drink excessively. Uh, drug addiction heterosexual pornography. There are those that, that are involved in non-homosexual pornography that are so gripped by it that, that it just, it makes them sick, and, but yet it's like drinking salt water and dying of thirst. They just keep drinking it, and it keeps making them thirstier. So homosexuality is very enslaving. It's often very normal and nice people who are homosexuals. They're often artistic, they're health conscious, and they're lost. In fact, over the years, I've had many homosexual friends. My friend Al Curley, other than when he was swearing at me and threatening, he was one of the nicest people I ever met. Kind, clean cut, neat, about as disciplined, I mean, health conscious, everything was neat. I mean, his car was polished, looked like it was brand new. They're, they're normal, nice people. But they have a heart of darkness. But so does everybody else that's lost. See, I think we need to realize that Christendom is not doing itself a favor by caricaturizing or characterizing homosexuals as kind of like monsters. There are monsters that are heterosexuals too. Does God say homosexuality is the worst sin? No. He said that others are equally damnable. You want to read Ezekiel 16, 49, which the homosexuals used to say that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not deviant sex. What God said is deviant sex is bad, but so is, and read the list in, in Ezekiel 16, 49. He said pride, arrogance, indolence, all of those things, God said, are equally damnable. You, you can go to hell for pride, and indolence as much as for homosexuality. Whoever's committed one sin is guilty of them all, apart from the justifying work. So, what we should pray for is that, that 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 be true of us at Calvary. And you know what that is? That, that we can, just like we prayed that we would have Muslims come in, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a group that would say that God's grace has washed me, sanctified me, and justified me from being a thief or covetous or drunkard or homosexual or sodomite.